We were at our ultrasound. We knew we were pregnant. We uh, were elated, found out on Mother's Day, and we're excited for the ultrasound. Right. Robert was there with the doctor, and the doctor, and we're all looking at the monitor, and the doctor says, okay, here's one, and it looks like a little comma with this beating heart. And we're like, yay, you know, because we were so excited to be pregnant. And then he says, okay, and here's another one, and that's like twins. That's awesome. Wow. And twins. we're like elated. And then he says, oh, and here's number three. And <laughs> start to get a little nervous. And then he says, and here's number four. It takes a little time for me to get my arms around the reality that's coming our way. And it didn't really hit me that day. Right. It, it, it you know, has come in waves annually. That means you're up in the middle of the night. All the time. 4 a.m. All the time. Two at a time. <laughs> Burping two at a time. Yeah. I'm pretty fast with a diaper. Your whole world just kind of shifts where you have a lot of time for, e I mean, for each other, for work, and then all of a sudden you have four babies that are yeah. relying on you, so the attention all goes to Ooh. them. It just brings back <laughs> such memories because I knew that our church community and prayer and just God had to be a part of this. Right. That we couldn't do it by ourselves. Right. And then you look up and phew, 21 years. Yeah, right. that's kind of crazy. So it's just uh, been riding the wave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, huh? What about that? <laughs> And they've been part of Shoreline Church through that whole journey. And many of you have walked that journey with them and brought meals and babysat and maybe changed a few diapers and walked alongside of them. Uh, navigating life's surprises. That's what we're talking about for the next five weeks in this amazing book called Nehemiah. This book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's you know, entire experience was kind of surprise after surprise after surprise after surprise. And if you look at your life and you say, boy, right now I'm in a time or a season or facing something I wasn't planning on, kind of surprise, this will be a great study for the next five weeks. If you're not there, there's a chance on the horizon there's something coming your way that you don't know is coming, but the things you're going to learn from the book of Nehemiah will be with you for the rest of your life. God wants to speak to you. God wants to encourage you. Be, because surprises are, are just, they, they are part of life. Life is a series of surprises. I, I can't think of the last time I got to the end of a week and I said something like this. I can't think of the last time I said, you know, this whole week went just the way I planned. I mean, no, nothing. I mean, just smooth, nothing, no. I mean, just exactly what I thought on my calendar, nothing changed. Boom. That's rare. What's more common is that we face life surprises. And we discover that surprises is a way of life. Surprises is just kind of what life is. And I lear I've learned this over and over again. At, at 15 years old, at 15 years old, I knew what my life was going to be like. I had my life planned. I knew as soon as I could, I was going to move out of my parents' house and move to Lake Tahoe. That was my plan. And I was going to ski in the daytime, and I was going to work at a casino and deal cards at night, and I was going to have the perfect life. I had it all planned. I was 15, and I knew what my future would look like. And less than a year later, my whole life changed. Surprise. Some young people who were Christians shared their story with me. They shared that they had met Jesus and that this Jesus was God with us. He, this Jesus loves us. He died on a cross for us. He offered forgiveness. And if I would just confess all my wrong things and dumb things and things I'd said and done I shouldn't have, if I just give God all my wrongs and ask Jesus to forgive me, he would enter my life, wash me clean, love me and give me a new life and take my hand and lead me all my life. So I received Jesus. And I didn't end up work, being a ski bum in Tahoe and working at a casino. Within 24 hours of giving my heart to Jesus, my very first prayer, I didn't grow up in the church, so I didn't grow up being taught how to pray. My first prayer was, Jesus, I accept you. That was my first prayer. My second prayer was, okay, Jesus, what do I do next? And I felt an absolutely clear leading. I, I knew I had to spend the rest of my life telling people about Jesus and helping people learn how to tell others about Jesus in natural, organic ways. Within 24 hours, I knew that would be the rest of my life. So, so here's a little shift. Ski bum, 21 dealer, pastor evangelist. Anybody else following the change there, the surprise there? 
right? Surprise, whole different life. Sometimes it comes quickly. Sometimes it comes over time. Sometimes it's overt. Sometimes it's gentle. Sometimes we choose that surprise and step into it. Sometimes God says, you got quads, good luck. No, God says, I'm with you, you know? But, but in all of those things, God is with us, and he wants to teach us how to navigate these surprises in, in a way that, that is powerful, in a way that is life-changing. And he wants us to navigate those surprises in a way that honors him and makes us who he wants us to be. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. If you have a Bible, a paper Bible, you can open back to the middle and then start turning to your left. You'll find Nehemiah after going a little bit left from there. If, you have a, you know, if it's on your phone or if you have an iPad or something, you just put in a search for Nehemiah chapter 1. And I want to let you know, I want to challenge you to do the daily reading for these next five weeks. The daily reading is in the Shoreline app, it's on the Shoreline website, and it's on your bulletin every week. So it's easy to find. And if you do the, this reading, you will read the book of Ezra twice, the book of Nehemiah three times, and a couple of the minor prophets that prophesied at this time in history. So you'll have the whole picture of this over five weeks. The best thing you can do is immerse yourself in the scriptures, read the, the passages that we kind of line up for you and the chapters we line up, and you will know this so well. And then when we, you hear the sermons, it'll all come together because you're immersing yourself in God's word. But let's begin at chapter one of Nehemiah, verse one. I'll give you the context in a minute because the context is so important, but let's first get the scriptures in front of us, all right? Here's how it begins. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant, God's people, that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. That was the capital, the holy city. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then it goes into Nehemiah's prayer, which we'll look at as we go forward. When you read this, you discover that here's Nehemiah, and, and he has this news that just crushes his heart and his soul. But to understand this text of the Bible and this book of Nehemiah, you have to understand the setting, the context. If you hear me teach over time, you'll hear me say this again and again. Every text has a context. Every passage of the Bible, every book of the Bible has a context, a setting that, where it sits in history, where it sits in God's word. And so to understand what's happening here, you have to understand the world at this time. So, so give me about three and a half minutes to give you the history of what's going on. If those of you that love dates and you're note takers, you can write down some dates, some specifics. Those that don't really like the dates, you want the storyline, just listen because to understand what's happening for, in Nehemiah's life and among God's people at that time, you have to understand what's happened before and the flow of history of what's going on. So here's a little setting uh, that brings us up to where Nehemiah is at. In about 586 BC, so 586 years before Christ came and walked on this earth, a king named Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon came down from Nebuchadnezzar into Jerusalem, the capital city of God's people of, of, of Israel. And he besieged the city, he overtook it, and he destroyed it. And he took the people away as captives. They became prisoners, prisoners of war. And so, and for some years before that, there had been conflict. Some of the people had been taken away, but this was kind of the final straw that broke the camel's back. And now God's people were gone. Jerusalem, the holy city, the walls are broken down, the temple's destroyed, their homes are burned. It's just a ruins. In 539 BC, the world history has changed some, and now the Persian Empire is rising, and Cyrus, who's the king of Persia, he sees all these Jewish people in the capital city and around the area, and he actually says to them in 539 BC, he says, you can go back to Jerusalem. You can go rebuild your lives, your city, your place of worship. As a matter of fact, Cyrus said, when Nebuchadnezzar came and, and destroyed the city. He took all the gold and silver articles, all the holy articles out of the temple, put them in his treasury. Cyrus says, you can have them all back. And you can go back, rebuild the temple, reestablish your lives. Oh, and by the way, you'll pay me lots of taxes and don't rebel against me or I'll come and crush you. But he said, but you can go back and reestablish your lives in Jerusalem. So some of the people went back. The next 80 years go by and the temple's not rebuilt. If you, when you read Ezra and Nehemiah, if you follow the reading, you'll get, you'll get the whole storyline. There's a series of Persian kings that rise and fall over 80 years, and they never rebuild the temple. They rebuild their houses, but the temple's still in ruins. Then a king rises up by the name of Artaxerxes. 
How do you spell it? Exactly like it sounds. Artaxerxes. You'll see, and it's also in Ezra and Nehemiah, so you need to check the spelling there. But Artaxerxes arises as king, and he's king for over 40 years. In the seventh year of his kingship, he, this is when Ezra goes back to Jerusalem. Ezra goes back, and that's the book. Ezra and Nehemiah are right side by side in the Bible. And in, in the ancient world, they were always on the same scroll. They were really pretty much the same book. Ezra and Nehemiah is a whole storyline. So we'll be reading that whole storyline. But Ezra goes back in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, and he begins to rebuild the temple with the people. And they get the temple rebuilt, but the walls are still torn down. And in the ancient world, if you didn't have protection for your city, every roving band that came by could come in and raid the city. That's when these people come to Nehemiah. They said, the people are back in Jerusalem. The temple's rebuilt, but the walls are torn down. And, and so, so Nehemiah mourns over that. And, and you have to also understand that Nehemiah is a prisoner of war. He's a stranger in a strange land. Nehemiah ended up there. Now, he's a couple generations later, but he knows that Jerusalem is, a, is his home and the Jewish people are his people. And he's never fully at home in this foreign land, but he, he's still there because most of the people are still in the lands that they were scattered to. Only some have gone back to Jerusalem. So Nehemiah is still there in, in a foreign land. He's in the capital in Susa. Nehemiah also was a servant to the king, to King Artaxerxes. Here's what he writes in chapter one, verse 11. I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah says, that was my job. I was cupbearer to the king. Let me tell you what the cupbearer to the king did. One of their responsibilities was to eat really delicious food and taste really good wine two or three or four times a day. Kind of cool. Why is he tasting it? To see if it's really delicious? No. Why is he tasting it? To make sure that it's not poisoned. Right? He's tasting it because he would... So what would happen is Nehemiah would have a lovely meal, enjoy really great food, really great wine, and he'd just kind of sit there and they'd watch him. And if he didn't die, they'd feed it to the king. That, that, was, that was one of his jobs. And, and, and understand, that means something. At that point, you realize, who is the only person who could, and, and many kings were assassinated by poison in their foods. Who was the only person who could actually kill the king and assassinate the king by poison? Nehemiah. He is deeply trusted. Deeply trusted by the king. He's the only one who could actually do the very thing that the king feared. That's Nehemiah. Also understand, in the ancient world, a cupbearer to the king who tasted their food and their drink also was in their inner circle. They had the ear of the king. They would give counsel. The king would ask them questions. I mean, they, they, they were part of the kind of the king's inner circle. And Nehemiah is a foreigner, but he's risen up to this place of great influence. And, and so, so this, is, this is the setting that we meet Nehemiah in. And then we also learn this, that Nehemiah, when he was called, he felt this call when he got news of what was happening in Jerusalem, this call to go and repair the wall and rebuild the city. And he heard the call. He felt it deeply. You're going to see that Nehemiah was a deeply feeling person. He felt deeply. He prayed passionately. That chapter one, most of chapter one is his prayer. And then he responded to the call. So I want to give you a picture of Nehemiah. As I thought about this, and, as I, and, and I've read through Nehemiah, I love the book of Nehemiah. I've read it a lot of times getting ready for this series, but also lots of times through the years I've been a Christian. And I, I get the picture of five different kind of vocational backgrounds that would define the kind of person Nehemiah was. So Nehemiah, in a, in a way, was like a psychologist. Nehemiah, you read the book of Nehemiah. He is figuring people out. He's watching what they're doing. He's checking the motives behind it. He has this way of discerning people. He's very insightful to people, how they work, why they work, what they do, why they do it. He's got the mind of a psychologist, all right? But Nehemiah also is, has the disposition of a military commander. He, he is looking at the circumstances. There is a battle going on. You'll see the, book, the entire book of Nehemiah is battle after battle after battle after battle. You'll see it. And he's like this brilliant military commander navigating through. Secret efforts to kind of lie to him and sneak to get him into a place where he could be compromised and, and fighting. I mean, just watching the whole scene. So military commander. He's also like a corporate leader. Short-term goals, long-term goals. Here's the objective. Motivate people. Get them together. Here's where we're going. Get him excited. And he's got that, that, that corporate business leader kind of a mindset. He's also a construction foreman. First thing he does when he gets to Jerusalem he goes and he walks through the entire city. He surveys it. Where's the damage? What gates need to be replaced? How, how much is the wall broken down? Where do the people live compared to where? And he, I mean, he assesses everything. And then through the book of Nehemiah, he is mobilizing these people to do this massive construction project. He is a construction foreman. And then, it's just in my own mind, I see him also as an MMA fighter, a mixed martial arts fighter. 
He is hardcore. You can't read the book of Nehemiah and not look at him and go, this guy just kicks a little fanny. That's the technical term. Um, but this guy, you, you look at him, he's a brawler. He has, he's not tapping out. He has no quit him. He's bringing it. He's bringing it. He's bring, every obstacle, bring it on, baby. And he just confronts it. All that in one person. You're going to see this as you read Ezra and Nehemiah, some of the prophets. You're going to see this, this composite sketch of this person, this fascinating, brilliant leader who has a tender heart and loves God. In the midst of all of that, his heart doesn't become hard. There's a tenderness of heart. Look with me at chapter 2, verse 1. In chapter 2 of Nehemiah, verse 1, we read this. In the month of Nisan, in the 12th year, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, 20th year of his kingship, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. There was a reason for that. I'll tell you in a minute. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Now you have to watch this next line. I was very much afraid. I'll tell you in a minute why he was afraid. But Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid that he noticed that I was sad. But I said to the king, may the king live forever, which is, by the way, what you said to kings in those days when you talked to him. May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, what is it you want? What the king could have said is remove him from my presence. And if that was done, he would have been executed. Because in those days, you didn't bring your emotions to the king. The king wasn't concerned about your emotions. He was concerned about you serving him. And when I was reading this, and when I was thinking about this, I thought about this scene in a movie I saw years ago called A, called a, a League of Their Own. And it was that 10-year period where there was this women's professional baseball league, partly during World War II. And there's a scene where the coach and manager, is man he's used to managing men and yelling at them a lot. And there's this one scene. I want you to notice what happens with this woman and then what he says to her, okay? Watch the screen. Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Oh. Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> he says, there's no crying in baseball. That's not allowed. We don't do that here. Anyway, here's the thing. There's no crying in front of the king. There's no sadness in the king's presence. There might be a court gesture to make the king happy, but you don't come in and bring the king down. And if you do, the king says, remove that person from my presence, and they're never seen again. So when Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid, it says, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of a heart. Bing, bing, bing. I mean, this is a problem. I was very, I was terrified, he says. But look what happens. Nehemiah feels so called to what God is moving in his heart to do. He lays it out in front of the king. He says, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? My people are exposed. And the king doesn't say, remove him from my presence. What does he say? What is it you want? And that call of God on Nehemiah's life begins to unfold. This is what, you know, the, the, the background is, is one that you have to understand. This is a big deal. So Nehemiah is listening to this message of what's happening back in the Holy Land and his heart's moved. He feels, he prays, and he finally takes action. He begins to, begins to move into action. And what we're gonna read over these coming five weeks in the Bible, what we're gonna learn together is that all the different surprises that come up for Nehemiah along the way, God is with him and God moves and God helps him navigate each one of them. It's not always easy. There's tough points along the way. You'll see that when you read Nehemiah. I mean, he had bullets coming at him from every direction possible. People lying about him, deceiving things, making up things, saying he said this when he didn't. And, and this is what he faced day in and day out. And he kept pressing on. He kept following God's will for his life. The surprise call of God. So, there's some different surprises that Nehemiah experiences. And I want to just look at a few of these, and I want you to think about Nehemiah experiencing these, but also how we experience these surprises, these kind of surprises in our life. Here's one surprise, Nehemiah's surprises. Surprised by God's timing. 
by God's timing, not planned by me. Has God ever opened the door for something for you where you didn't plan it that way in the timing? Of course. Nehemiah is in Susa. He's, he's in the capital. He's working for the king. Life's pretty good. He's not really planning on packing up and going to a broken down city and doing a major construction project. That's not on his agenda. That's not on his plans. But surprise, God has something in mind for him. Not his timing, but God's timing. And, and, and our lives, our lives can be just a series of, of learning. Do I make everything work according to my timing? I keep a really detailed calendar. I like calendars. I like scheduling. I like advanced planning. But I try to help live my whole life planned to where I'm going, but ready to respond if God leads in a new direction. I'm trying to plan according to God's leading and then move and change according to God's leading. I actually plan a whole year of preaching in advance. 2020 is planned for Shoreline. I don't have every sermon finished, but I know the biblical text. I know the key themes. I know the, the biblical passage. I know where we're going. But if the Spirit leads, we'll drop a whole series and do something different. And we've done, we did that last year. And we'll do it again. But, but, but knowing where God is leading. Surprised by God's timing. And God's timing is oftentimes not ours. When Sherry and I got married, we, started, we were married for a couple of years. Then we started a family. And we had a son. And then we had a second son. And, and I just kind of felt like that was the right, I kind of felt like that's the right family for us. It felt right to me. And so I, I, know, so I said, sure, I think this, this, you, know, you and I and Zach, Zach and Josh is a great family and just felt, it just felt right. And Sherry said, I really feel like God has one more child for us. Anybody see the problem here? Um, <laughs> so I said, stay away from me, woman. No, I didn't. But I, but, but, you know, I, said, I, said, I said, well, I said, I really feel like for you and I and two kids, it feels like the right family for us. And so she did something really sneaky. Here's what she did. Watch this. She does this. She goes, well, I'll just pray God changes your heart. Oh, please. She's a really good prayer. She wrote a book about prayer. Um, and so, and God changed my heart. Uh, but, but in my mind, and, 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 then, and then when God gave us Nate, our third son, it was exactly right. But it wasn't so much my plan and it wasn't my timing. Everybody following me? And so, and so Nehemiah realized that you're sometimes surprised by God's timing that isn't ours. But God's timing is always right. And if his timing is right, then we have to adjust to it. Here's another surprise. Surprised by the magnitude of the call that it's bigger than me. When Nehemiah got this call, when he went to Jerusalem and looked at the situation, he was profoundly aware he could not do this unless the whole community worked together, unless God was with them, protecting them. And that's what it took. It took the hand of God and the community of people all together. When you see, you know, see God moving and leading and you feel a call in your life and you look at it, you're gonna oftentimes say this, this is too big for me. I can't do this. I can't handle this. That's a good place to be. As long as you're standing side by side with God. Because where you lack the power, he never lacks the power. We can be surprised by the magnitude, how big the call is, what God is doing. Nehemiah surprises, surprised by emotions. That God captures our heart. God captured Nehemiah's heart. You don't, you don't get a sense when you read the book of Nehemiah that he's like this overly mushy, uh, you know, you're not an MMA kind of a personality, but I'm also really teary-eyed. I mean, he's, he's a pretty intense guy, but when he hears what's happening in Jerusalem, when he hears that his people are exposed and the wall is broken down and enemies are coming in and destroying the city, it breaks his heart. Sometimes when God's leading you, you will be surprised at how he stirs your heart. And one of the signs that God is leading you is that he begins to draw your heart towards you. You say, I, I care about this. I, 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 I'm broken over this. I want to see something happen here. And that may be God capturing your heart so he can capture attention and lead you to something new. But surprised by emotions. Here's another surprise. Surprised by the length of the journey, the massive investment. Boy, when God calls us to do certain things and to follow us in certain ways, whether it's a vocation some of you, so, you know, so I can say, well, I was called to be a pastor. Some of you are called to be doctors. Some of you are called to be lawyers. Some of you are called to be in the, in the service industries or in construction. Some of, you, some of you are called, many of our church members are called to be in the military. All of these things, the, 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 the length of the journey, when you're called to something, there's going to be moments, of our, our families in the military, there's moments where you go, man, it's been five years, 10 years, 15 years, and times that we're separate and where, where our family's not together and, and the weight of it all, and you go, man, it just... It just feels like it goes on forever and ever. That sometimes is part of the call in our lives. Sometimes it's a long journey. Nehemiah's journey was a long, hard journey. That actually went after the wall was finished and he came back. There was also a rebuilding effort in the, among the, the lives of the people because they were making bad choices in their lives again. It was a long journey. 
I think about Robert and Jeannie Ward. If you, you look at this picture here of, okay, that's, that's for, for year one, year 21. There, there had to have been nights with those four kids that felt like 21 years. You know, I like when Robert goes, I'm burping two at a time. I'm pretty good at changing diapers. I'm pretty fat. You know, it's like, that, there's different seasons. Now, were they great seasons? Yes, but they were probably long, challenging seasons. The nice thing is now they all get 21 as a parent. Now you have no more responsibilities, right? <laughs> okay, that's all you that have kids that are, that are young adults or that you are young. And this is part of the journey. This is life, right? And sometimes the journey takes longer than you think. It's huge investment of ourselves, our time, our prayers, our care, our lives. And one more surprise. Surprise by the cost of the calling. That when you follow God's calling in your life, I'm not just talking vocationally, I'm talking about in anything. If you're, if you're called to foster children, if, if you're called to be, start a ministry or be involved in volunteering in a ministry in a church, it takes all of you. It takes, when you're following God, it means surrendering all of who you are. You say, well, how can I do that? Well, our theme this year is more like Jesus. Just keep looking at Jesus. Every time you start to feel weary, look at Jesus. I love how Hebrews says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. When you feel weary, look to the one who gave everything for you and keep pressing on. You may be in a, in a marriage where you're feeling weary and tired and you feel God saying, hang in there. And you're like, I don't know if I can. And if God is saying, hang in there, hang in there. Listen to his voice. You're raising a family and you're weary and you're tired. You're in a vocational place where it's hard, but you have the sense that God's called me here and I'm here for a reason. But man, I could just, if it was up to me, boom, I'm out of here. But if, you, if God's calling you to be there, hang in there. And, and until God calls you out, give everything you have to what he calls you to do. That's just the way it is when you walk with Jesus. I want to share a few lessons from Nehemiah. These are lessons that we'll unpack in the coming weeks. I, I want to, one more time, I want to just do all I can as your pastor and as somebody who wants God's best for you. I want to challenge you that six to seven days a week, from now for the next four weeks, that you would follow the Bible reading that we give in the, on the app and in the, on the website and on your bulletin, that you would dig into God's word. Because you're going you're gonna to hear the story in a fresh way. These lessons will come alive. But here's some lessons from Nehemiah. Lesson number one, pay attention even to problems. Do you notice when Nehemiah got his call? He's taking, working for the king, doing what he does. Some people come and they share what's going on. And it's bad news. The city's in ruins. The wall's broken down. The people are exposed. It'd be easy for him to just go, oh, well, that's too bad, too bad for them. I'm here in Susa. They're there. He could have just kind of kept an arm's length right? But he paid attention. And it's bad news, but sometimes the bad news is what God calls you to help solve a problem with. So pay attention, even when you hear problems and bad news. A second lesson. Think in terms of God's power and not my limitations. Always think in terms of the power of the living God and not what I can or can't do. When I received the call to come to Shoreline Church, when I felt God calling me to come here, I looked at Shoreline and just thought, I can't do this. And you know what God put in my heart? You're exactly right. You're in the perfect place. But you can do the work with all these people together serving me and with the Holy Spirit in you and God's power on you. When you look at a situation and say, I can't do it, ask the question, but can God? And if God's calling you, God can do above and beyond what we imagine or dream. That's what God loves doing. So when you feel overwhelmed and like it's too much, think in terms of God's power, not my limitations. Lesson number three. Take note of your emotions. Pay attention to your emotions, to what you're feeling. Because God speaks through our emotions at times. If there's a passion and a joy and an excitement about something, God might be drawing you into that. If there's a burden and a heartache, someone has to do something. It might be God saying, and that someone is you. Pay attention to what's happening in your heart because God will speak to your heart at times, sometimes before you catch it with your brain. But notice what's happening in your heart and when God gives you a passion or a desire for something. Lesson number four, hang in there. Hang in there. Some of you heard the call to fostering a child, to starting a family, the call to enter a marriage relationship, the call to a vocation, the call to the military. It could be a hundred different things. 
but you stepped into something and, and you, you just knew God was calling you, but you're in that point in the journey where you're just tired. And you're weary. And you go, I just don't know if I can keep pressing on. You want to know how many times Nehemiah hit that point? Read the book of Nehemiah probably every day. He had every possible enemy coming against him. Even enemies from within the community and from outside the community. And there were people in the community that were whispering, talking to people outside the community and building alliances and bringing them in. And it was just like, it was like Nehemiah felt like everyone was against him because almost everyone was. And he kept pressing on. And it's when you press through those things that God does his best work in this world and in our lives and in his church. Years ago, when Sharon and I got got married 35 years ago, we started dating 37 years ago. And we knew early on that we had a calling together to help train churches to share the message of Jesus. And for the last 37 years, we've been working on that together. And about five years ago, we began to partner with Shoreline to make Organic Outreach International. We'd already written books about it, and we'd been training people around the world, but kind of just out of our basement, kind of out of our house. And, and then, then with Shoreline, we formed this ministry, Organic Outreach International. And I can't tell you how many, I mean, and, and so here's the call, of, here's Shoreline's mission, to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. That's the whole world. The mission of Organic Outreach International is to train leaders and pastors and churches so that they can then equip all their people to go out and share the gospel of Jesus. And it's happening. We're, we're now resourcing over 43,000 churches globally, meaning we train, they train this person and they oversee 500 churches and they're not training their people in what we train. We train this person, they oversee a whole denomination in America. We're training key leaders around the world. We just had a team in India training about 500 leaders and how to share faith naturally. They're gonna go to 500 churches all over India and have an impact there. But I can't tell you how many times in the last 35 years that it, I've just gotten weary. It's like, man, this call to motivate people to go talk about Jesus. I mean, every Christian says, of course I want to tell people about, about Jesus. Say, so, well, tell me how often you do it. Well, never, of course never. It scares me to death. But I think I should. And God says, okay, Kevin, spend your whole life helping people do the very thing that scares them the most. That's part of my calling. And there's times I, I get weary and say, is this going anywhere? And then the other day, I got in the mail, and I'll show you up on the screen here. I got in the mail three copies of one of the books that Sherry and I have written. The bottom three are in Hindi, Telugu, and Tamil, I think is how you pronounce it, but <coughs> and then English and Spanish. The resources that we've created and that we partner with Shoreline to get around the world are now being put in other languages and impacting leaders all over the globe. And I look and say, I could never imagine that, and if it was up to me, I would have quit 50 times but you just keep pressing on and pressing on. And then God does what we could never do. And just so you know, you're part of that. The ministry of Organic Irish International is a ministry under Shoreline Church. And we partner together. And so God's at work there. And then one more lesson. Remember that sacrifice is a big part of becoming more like Jesus. If you're gonna follow God, our theme this year is becoming more like Jesus. More like Jesus. Excuse me. And so as we become more like Jesus, part of that journey will be sacrifice. We're going to sacrifice our time. We're going to sacrifice our resources. We're going to sacrifice our desires. We're going to sacrifice everything. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. That's what Jesus did. If you say, I want to be more like Jesus, somebody tell me, what's the biggest thing Jesus ever did? He died on a cross and rose again. He gave his whole life for us. He left the glory of heaven. Sacrificed all of that to come as one of us and to take our sins. To live for Jesus is to willingly sacrifice and count the cost. Jesus said, if you're gonna be my follower, every day take up your cross. Deny yourself. Follow me. At what point did being a Christian become easy and all about me? That's not biblical Christianity. And Nehemiah's story in the Old Testament paints this picture of someone who said, I will follow God's call whatever it costs. And you know what? Nehemiah saw the wall built and the gates put back in their places and the city secured. And they worshiped and they celebrated. When you you hang in there and follow God's call, willing to sacrifice, even if it's bigger than you, God will do what we could never imagine happening. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer as we begin this journey walking through the book of Nehemiah. Our prayer is is that you will give us the courage to follow you. We pray that Nehemiah will be this incredible example that that after these five weeks, we will so know the story of Ezra and Nehemiah in this time in history that it will inspire us and prepare us so that when we face 
the different challenges of life. When, when we are called to navigate the surprises that come our way, we're ready to do it in your power and for your glory. Oh God, meet with us in these five weeks. I pray that each person gathered here, each person in the family worship venue, and each person online, I pray that together we will dig into your word and study it and read it deeply and let you speak to our hearts and that you would prepare us to navigate the surprises that are coming our way. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. And everyone said...